Thanks everyone for being here. It is our favorite time of the week because we get to talk to our amazing community of winners and advocates and activists from all over the world who are working on important, amazing, extraordinary projects across all kinds of issues from all kinds of perspectives. Um, and so without further ado, let me introduce our guest for this week, Lola Bakuri, who is the owner of B Co. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica, and, and thank you for creating this initiative. Um, I'm happy to have been in the first class of Anthem participants, and it's just such an awesome full circle experience to be here talking about the work with you today. Yeah, no, uh, congratulations on being an inaugural winner. It's an amazing, extraordinary accomplishment, and we're so happy to have you with us. Thank so, you. Yeah, tell us, tell us your story. Tell us about who you are. Tell us your background. I love to hear from people kind of about their journey and what brought them to the work today. And tell us, for those who don't know, what is BCO and what is the, some of the work you do? Absolutely. So, I mean, I'm a great example for everybody listening of, you know, the sort of new career path in marketing, which can include any combination of traditional corporate roles and, you know, your own independent consultancy work. Mm. So I fell into that seven years ago and in the past couple of years have formalized my independent consulting practice into this brand called Beco that's all about inspiring marketing executives to become their highest professional selves mm -hmm. um, through any combination of one-on-one -on -one executive coaching for CMOs and um, you know senior marketing leaders um, work with their teams sort of one-on-one -on -one project work and then this really just dear to my heart um, you know, swim lane that I have around inclusive marketing. Mm -hmm. And what does it look like to create a toolkit for marketing leaders today that helps them navigate their desire to contribute to the social impact world while also contributing to the bottom line of their brand with marketing? So mm -hmm. it's a very specific, you know, slice of the sort of DEI pie, if you will, um, that we're playing in, you know, the, the part that's at the intersection of social impact and marketing, but that's one of the things I'm super passionate about and what brought me to um, submit Maximize the Movement to the Anthem Awards. Amazing. Tell us about your inclusive marketing strategy. How is it different from, you know, say how other companies might think about marketing strategies? I, I love that question. I mean, it's different in that it, I have, I, my goal and my hope and, and some of the feedback that I've gotten is that the Maximize the Movement framework really strips down these ideas into their most simple form, into their most intuitive form. So at its basis is really what we all already know about stakeholder capitalism, triple bottom line thinking, however you want to you know, language it, it's the idea that a business can not only be more productive in providing for its shareholders with value, if it also, um, considers its impacts across other stakeholders like communities, um, you know, like marginalized groups, etc. Um, and the idea that as a marketer, you're always going to want to employ the, the strategy that allows you to most efficiently create value. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's where it's not about just representation, which is the conversation we've been having around multicultural marketing for so long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea that you want your marketing to reflect visually the population. Well, no, what we're, what we're saying with inclusive marketing and maximizing movement is that's great and it's low hanging fruit, but the higher hanging fruit that will actually have a bigger impact on your business as well is to start figuring out how your campaigns, how your initiatives can actually measurably solve these real social impact problems for the communities that you want to advocate for. And, and how can that actually build your brand's equity with your entire audience? Mm -hmm. So it's getting past this thinking that um, convinces us that only X people care about X people's problems. Right. You know, that's not, I mean, look, at, why, why do you work at the Anthem Awards, Jessica? Are you, are you working at the Anthem Awards only to solve your problems? No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not that. <laughs> <laughs> and so these, are, and there's nothing revolutionary about these ideas. It, right. it, it's at the, it's, it's at the crux of um, marketing strategy at its most basic. Like 101 is you figure out what your audience cares about and you deliver right. it. And so this is relevant right now, and it needs to be about more than just visual representation. 
Talk a little bit about, um, you know, obviously this has been an issue that's been at the forefront of the zeitgeist more so in the past few years, but definitely in the past decade, if not longer. Um, sure. Talk about it. brands are really pushing this as a priority. Some do it really well. Some do not. Can you talk about what are some of the like just obvious things that people get wrong? That the you criteria, see? yeah. I mean, and that's 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 at the uh, sort of heart of what the Maximize Movement Framework offers. It's like yeah. if you consider all the things on this one page of paper, you are not going to be accused of being performative if you get it right. So right. it's like easy to understand. We love frameworks as marketers. We love yeah. checklists, all those sorts of things. And so I that's really at the crux of what it is. And yeah. so, what you, oh, you, you're saying we love we love a framework. I love a framework. I love a checklist. <laughs> I mean, you, look at how excited you got just by those nerdy words. This is awesome. Um, so, you know, I, I think if your 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 question is around, um, I'm losing my train of thought here a little bit. What was the some of the things that people do wrong? The, some of the things that people get wrong. Okay, yeah. so if the 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 first thing to really look out for when it comes to are you being performative? We'll start in the middle of the framework, which is social impact. So it's R, S, R, let's start with the S. Um, are you actually making a measurable impact to the community that you're advocating for or the cultural cause that you're advocating for? Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between a platitude type of statement. Mm -hmm. Like I talk about this example all the time. You remember right after the murder of George Floyd, Uber came out and had all these billboards and they were saying, you know, if, if you're a racist or something like that, delete your account. Like, it's a nice statement. What does that mean? What's the end? Like, okay, like, so you're on the side of not racism, thanks. You're asking people to delete their accounts. Are you creating right. a mechanism for that to happen? Right. Are you going to let us know how that went? Mm -hmm. Are you going to ask some sort of question in the onboarding experience of the Uber app that makes you sort of validate that as a rider, as a driver, I am not... Um, someone who perpetuates these ideas. And if you're not doing that, then it's not measurable mm -hmm. and you're not really making an impact. So you need to go back to the drawing board. So that's that I'll, I'll pause there, like really thinking about whether someone can say, well, what we were setting out to do actually had a positive effect on the, the desired um, audience or the community that was meant to be served. And so a pro example, on the other side of that coin would be something like what City is doing and has been doing with uh, the Action for Racial Equity campaign. Mm -hmm. So in the banking industry, what are some of the historical wrongs that are very relevant to every single brand? Well, disenfranchisement of black and brown people when it comes to financial products. Mm -hmm. Great, we're gonna launch an initiative that will be involved in our marketing and it'll be part of how we go to market, but we're gonna focus on actually solving that business problem and that's what we're going to talk about at the top of the funnel. So right. that's sort of the difference. Right. Well, I think, too, the way you just described has, like, actually creating products and services that solve problems, create real impact, and then you do marketing around that. I mean, marketing exactly. should just be like, you're just telling, you don't have to make stuff up. You're just telling no. what you're doing. And you're being choiceful about the cultural causes and the marginalized groups or you know, underinvested in groups that you want mm -hmm. to advocate for and focus on. Yeah. So that's one of the, the, I think the reasons why there's a lot of maybe more negative conversation right now about this opportunity is that people don't see that we're not saying you shouldn't be choiceful. Mm. Every brand can't go after um, sort of making a measurable impact towards every societal yeah. problem, right? right? Right. But if you look within as a brand, as a marketing leader, and you start to see where some of the, um, you know, intersections point, intersection points are between what you deliver, how you deliver it, and what groups still need to be advocated for, then you find your sweet spot. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's really finding ways for brands to do this work, like authentic authentically in a way that connects to their business model. Again, you don't need exactly. to up. talk a little bit about how you work with brands, how you add value to brands. What's some. Sure. Some I mean, and this for everybody out there, I, I, I'm also a good example of where when you decide you want to have an impact in a certain space, there are a number of ways you can do it. And it's okay to spend some time figuring out, 
how that's going to work. So when I first set out to create Maximize the Movement, I envisioned it as something where, you know, as an individual solo practitioner, I would be coming in and actually helping teams ideate on what are the right ways to approach these problems. What mm -hmm. I learned and what, what I have experienced as something that's much more scalable is, well, can I turn this into sort of a workshop where I'm right. teaching these principles? And at the end, I know you're going to share the link for folks to download, um, you know, a one pager of that framework, but that's where I'm really focused on. So whether it's my thought leadership on LinkedIn, where I spend way more time than Instagram, you know, it's fun to be here, um, or it's coming, you know, and sitting with a team for an hour over a period of time, um, you know, every three months or something like that and talking to them about how they can really learn these principles and start thinking this way in their day-to-day -day work, that's where the impact really comes in. So, so it's, it's really is more of a teacher and an inspirer mm -hmm. than a collaborator per se, um, because I fully believe that marketing teams that are staffed appropriately have the ability to do this work on their own. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. With their existing agencies, I don't think it needs an entire overhaul in your staffing, but it takes a mindset shift mm -hmm. of the folks who are making those decisions every day who are writing the creative briefs, and that's who I aim to influence. I think you, you just said two really important phrases. One, properly staffed, uh, really jumped out to me as one. Phrase. Major caveat, right? <laughs> <laughs> properly staffed. And then the other is that it doesn't need a major overhaul. I saw that on your website too. Can you talk about that? You, you said something like- Yeah, I mean, was, there, it, look, I have a lot of friends who, I, if, if any of them are watching, there are their schools of thought around any work um, involving diversity, equity, inclusion, um, that incrementalism isn't something we should focus on. It doesn't get us anywhere to make small changes towards these big problems. I happen to disagree with that. Mm -hmm. So when I say that it doesn't take an overhaul, what I mean is, if, even if you are a, let's call you, I'm making this up, a, a $10 million a year revenue business, small business, you know, one town, your brand delivers something, let's say you're in the grocery business or something like that, like, you don't have to be a PepsiCo to take right. advantage of these principles. Mm -hmm. And if the pe people figuring out how to spend even your $100,000 marketing budget are doing it in ways that actually make a meaningful and measurable social impact. Not only is that work going to be more effective, but it's also going to allow them to be able to say, wow, like we were pioneers in this space for businesses that didn't think they had a role to play. So, so that's what I really mean. It's, it's not about something that needs to cost a ton of money. Mm -hmm. It's not about something that needs to take you off course of what your existing strategy is. It's just how can you take this framework, and start to examine your annual marketing plan and look for the opportunity areas where you can shift things, exactly, tweak things, dial things up, dial things down, um, to start to play more in this space. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's great. Can you talk about, you shared a couple examples before, but do you have any anecdotes of a brand that you worked with that, you know, was just like had a great impression on you, big transformation, something like that? Hmm. I mean, I wish I could say in you know two years since I've been thinking of these ideas that there have been enough time to actually have that full circle, um, you know, piece coalesce. So, so I, I don't think I have a good example for you in terms of my direct like work product impact. But what I will tell you is that I hear all the time from people who tell me, "Oh wow, when I read that, when I thought about that, when you said that, when you spoke with us, like." it made me change the way I think about X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Like I'm now going to be more cognizant of A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those little mini moments of, of um, evidence that this mindset shift is changing the way people make decisions um, is super exciting to me. And I think we're going to see way, way, way more of it. Um, mm -hmm. If I had to give an example of a brand that I just want everyone to be aware of as a best in class example of this type of thinking, there are two actually that come to mind. The first is Google Pixel. We all saw that amazing Super Bowl ad with Lizzo. Yeah. And that is a prime example of a product-driven solution. Solves a historical industry problem that matters to everyone, not just the people experience it. Mm -hmm. Us being able to show up on our camera phones in ways that actually represent what we look like. Mm -hmm. Knowing that it was made for us, right? So that's one. Another is what MasterCard did with True Name. Mm -hmm. making it possible for people who are trans or non-binary to easily change 
the name on their credit card without having to have the official paperwork, right. saving them from that, not just embarrassing and sort of non um, self actualizing, but also really dangerous experience that can happen when that's not the case. Right. So just those are just a few examples of where, you know, these opportunities are everywhere. We just right. need to decide it's a priority to focus on them. I think too, those are such good examples too, because again, those are product driven. Right. Like actually creating real products. It's not just an ad that like feels good for this moment. That's like a great story or something. It's actually creating products to solve uh, societal problems. It's based on something substantive. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be, there are pure campaign examples where you can have, you know, some level of measurable impact. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I want, I'm bringing this up because it is, it's another disconnect I think people have. Well, what role does marketing really have to play? We're not here to save the world. Like, why don't we just focus on making sales? Again, none of that is wrong. But what we're saying is if you have a budget and you are going to spend it mm-hmm. to drive a business in growth or to create, you know, incremental revenue or whatever your business goals are, if you can do that in a way that actually allows you to achieve those objectives more effectively, but mm-hmm. also creates a meaningful social impact, why wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Like, you'd have to be a monster to not. <laughs> you have to believe that we don't have a role to play in, in stewarding the world that we've been given. As corny as that sounds, like, no, we all do believe in that, and that's why it matters. Because that money's going to be spent, whether it even attempts to make a social impact or not. Uh, yeah. I don't think that sounds corny, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> so you talked a lot about measurable impact. How do you define success for marketing campaigns or marketing choices? Or how do you look at how diversity, equity, inclusion connects to those marketing choices? Talk a little bit about that, the impact piece. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the short answer is that it, it's no more difficult or easy than it is in any other scenario where you're where you have a particular marketing objective and you're trying to decide if it worked. Mm-hmm. So at the most basic level, it's what were your business objectives? What were and those might be bottom line driven. Those might be sentiment driven. Um, we didn't get to talk about the reputation part of the framework, but one of your goals as a brand might just be to right. increase your NPS. Yeah. year over year. Okay, so whatever that thing is that you're trying to achieve, mm-hmm. whether or not it happened, A, like that's across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to the social impact pieces, it, it's trickier, right? But, in, and it's not something that we can teach people to do in the you know, next eight or 10 minutes that we have here, but um, the, the mindset shift to focus on is how can I create a hypothesis or some sort of um, indicator of, of measurable change that I know I can actually literally count <laughs> or have counted in some way and report um, back on, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and how can I use that as my metric? Right. So for example, we talked about Uber with, you know, if you're racist, delete your account and nothing actually happening. Yeah. Airbnb, a little differently, you know, as we all know, if you've ever hosted or, or even now, I think is a guest as well, but there's some sort of, a you have to actually um click a checkbox that says i'm not going to use you know the race or identity of potential guests at my at my home to make the decision on whether they can say it's i mean of course the copy i'm sure is much more uh succinct than that but they, they created that mechanism so okay now you can start to measure well how many people actually click that right and then you can start to say well actually we had a good percentage of people who, you know, the whizzes in our analytics department were able to tell us psychographically may actually not be who we want hosting, and they fell out of the funnel. Mm. So, like, that's actually a great metric, too. Mm -hmm. Who did you fire? Right, right, right. Right, who's lost? Who's lost? That can be a positive metric. Do you want to talk about the other um, letters in the acronym in the framework? Yes, so we talked about um, social impact, but the two R's are really interesting too. Let's talk about the first one, and that's revenue. So we're dancing around this. I love that you brought in the word business model, um, and that's really what it's about. Like, it's a little counterintuitive because we do hear, you know, people ma- wanting to make sure that, well, brands, you shouldn't just be doing this to profit. Like, 
if you're not if you're doing it just to profit, it can't actually be something that's going to have a measurable social impact that's genuine and not performative. But if you really start to interrogate that notion, maybe mm -hmm. it's exactly the opposite. Right. If you if a brand and a company in a capitalist society, which we are, we can debate whether we should be, that's another conversation. Right. That's next week's conversation. Right? But like, what are you going to keep doing? You're going to keep doing the things that are bringing profitability, incremental revenue, all those, all those sort of dollars and cents, bottom line things back to the business. That's what businesses stay invested in. That's what gets the most support. That's what gets the most staffing. So you need to figure out how to thread your social impact marketing needle um, in a way that you are actually able to prove that it's good for the business too. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that because you're, you're also, of course, going to check that real non-performative social impact box as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's obviously such a core pillar of the triple bottom line concept is like, we can't have one without the other, right? right. It's like it all together and has to work together in a meaningful way. And we have um, nonprofits, you know, and that's, there, are whole, there are lots of other debates we can have about how efficient, you know, the initiatives there are, but we have to think differently about the way a for-profit business approaches their social impact marketing initiatives. Yeah. We're not right. talking about CSR or ESG or corporate responsibility. We are, we are specifically in the lane of marketing right now. And so whether or not what you're doing has revenue impact is 100% gonna be a driver of whether or not it was performative. Yeah, that's such a great distinction. I'm glad you brought that up because the marketing team is you know, very distinctly different than those other teams, right? And often in a big corporation, like they don't even need to talk to each other or work together. They might be in different buildings or in different states even, or might even kind of just sort of know who each other is and they're working on completely different things. So Exactly, yeah. I mean, and, and there are now, I'm interested in a lot of the sort of, um, hub of spokes roles I'm seeing pop up to try and bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. So plug for a friend of mine who wrote an amazing textbook on this topic, oh, Maddie Kulkarni. She's a um, DEI marketing executive at PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. And that is her role to sort of work with the, the various brands across the ecosystem and help them bridge these gaps between mm -hmm. these social impact marketing opportunities based on what the company's doing, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the CSR, ESG side of the business with actual go to market. So there, there, there are a lot of opportunities there too. Oh yeah, absolutely. For sure. We're getting close to our time here. I want to end with two last questions. One, can you tell us what is the, your favorite thing about the work that you do? Oh, oh wow. That's such a great question. Um, it's funny, I was at dinner last night as, as we were chatting earlier, I let Jessica know that I'm just coming back in from New York and a friend of mine kind of said that she was like, you really love what you do. Yeah, that's great. And, it, and it's true. And, and, and there's so many aspects of it, but I think it's getting to exist at the intersection of teaching of sort of like deep marketing nerd thought leadership, focusing on the idea space. So like, you know, sometimes our weaknesses are our strengths. I think sometimes it can be a weakness to be more of a theoretical ivory tower person when you are on the operational side of the business. And I always felt that tension in my corporate jobs. Mm. Um, so I started my career in the traditional CPG world. That is a brand marketer is pretty much a general manager. It's mm. much more like being a CEO than it is being, you know, someone who works in that agency mm. for that brand. Um, so that tension of wanting to play more in the creative and sort of ideation space was always niggling at me. And in the work I do today, I kind of get to touch all of those parts equally. Mm -hmm. um, and it just feels, we use the word actualizing before to talk about something else, but I'll use that here for me, just completely actualizing to be able to use all of those muscles on any given day. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Um, I'm very happy for you that you found that niche. It's wonderful. If you. My last question is, if there's like one thing that you want folks to take away from this as they think about inclusive marketing and marketing strategy, DE&I practices, what's like the one thing that you know nothing else, you need to know this? It's a great question, Jessica. 
<laughs> you have a role to play. Mm. You have a role to play. And because I, I was trying to think, what's going to be relevant to everyone who's watching now or might watch this on replay? You, mm. you, looking at you, yes, you, have a role to play. Mm. Whether or not you even work in marketing, you mm. know someone who does. Yeah. Like, start to ask these questions. Start to challenge our sort of assumptions of what's appropriate in terms of the status quo, right? And if you are working in a marketing role, then you definitely have a role to play in, you know, the conversation that we're having today. Um, and it doesn't have to take over your life to start playing that role. Mm. It's about making a decision, even one each day, that promotes inclusivity and equity more mm -hmm. so than you did the day before. Mm -hmm. And like making that something that you're committed to. Mm -hmm. Everything's only gonna get better for all of us if we do. And I, that's such great advice. And also I would encourage folks who've gotten it wrong in the past to try again and try to- Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That, and you know, that might even be a more important takeaway, Jessica. Like let's double down on that. Um, I'm very critical of the conversations that we're having around cancel culture and how harmful it is. Mm -hmm. Because the only thing that's actually happening is a culture of accountability has started to take root. Mm -hmm. And a culture of open, um, you know, and sometimes tough to hear and uncomfortable critique mm -hmm. on topics that people have never really wanted, especially people that don't affect have never really wanted to confront. There's this great book called Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America by Ijeoma Luo that everybody should read if you want to dig into this idea of like how scary it is for some people mm. that the status quo is shifting. Right. But, but what everyone else who understands it that it needs to has to do on a daily basis is question that notion when people say, well, what do you mean, cancel? You mean somebody said that they should have done it differently on Twitter? Mm. Well, what happened to them? They woke right. up the next day and they went to work. Or maybe they did something so egregious they got fired for, from their job. Right. They woke up the next day and they got a new one. Yeah. So there really is, this cancel thing is it's a huge obfuscation, I think that's the word, right? Um, from what we really need to be focused on and I want to see more people disrupting those conversations in real time. I was just talking about this earlier with someone too, about how so many folks who get canceled, like literally six months later, they're like back. And it's like, oh, okay. No, every, every, no, there is no, can, like, there, there is no canceled. It's just not a thing. It's, made it up. it's very temporary. It's temporary. I mean, not to be cheeky, but you remember the, um, CNN anchor or MSNBC, I can't remember which, Jeffrey Tubin, right? And I love Jeffrey Tubin. Oh, yeah. He's I'm a huge fan of his book about the OJ trial. We can talk about that a different time. Um, but, you know, he had his incident. Jeffrey Tubin's working. I don't think he ever stopped working. So this idea that we're coming after all the people in power with cancellations, is, mm -hmm. it's a fallacy. Yeah. Okay, tell us about where can people find you on the internet? Yes work stuff like that website well at first i want to thank you jessica thank you okay i want to thank you for having me i want to thank you for um of course the opportunity that your team created to have this work recognized as part of the um anthem awards awardees of uh whatever year we're in 2022 um i want to encourage everybody to apply literally if you think you you have something to submit please do. Don't let that voice in your head say, mm, maybe it's not relevant enough. Um, and if you want to stay in touch with me, follow me on LinkedIn. You can follow me here, but you won't see much because I focus there um, uh, as far as creating content. And, you know, you'll see ongoing thoughts about this topic and other things meant to help marketing leaders become their highest professional selves. And about this time next year, if everything goes as, as it should, um, the book version of these ideas will be coming out. I just solidified that yesterday. So, um, so that's another thing to look out for in the long term. But hope to see you on LinkedIn, everyone. Um, you know, the months leading up to that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. 
I just so appreciate so appreciate you and all the other folks out there. I really think of this as a community. Like, yes, is it is an award. I, it is also a community of people. It's also a platform to provide a mirror back of all the folks in the world who are working on all kinds of things, all kinds of perspectives from all kinds of approaches across all kinds of causes. So thank you for the work that you do. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for the work that you do, Jessica.